thanks very much. Um, so my name is Michael Vavra. I'm a developer evangelist with Twilio. And for a long time, I was a C-sharp developer. And the great thing about working at Twilio is I kind of get to do more, not exactly what I want, but pretty much whatever I want. And uh, I want to talk to you today a little bit about how I moved from being a C-sharp developer or a Microsoft.NET developer um, to being a Ruby developer. Um, and just in case you don't want to listen to me talk, basically all I'm going to tell you is how C Sharp is really about types and type safety. And Ruby is more about freedom. Um, in actual fact, I, I just thought freedom, I'm doing a kind of a Aaron Patterson thing here, aren't I? A freedom code. Anyway, um, in actual fact, when I first wrote this talk, I was thinking about how it was moving from like misery and joy of C Sharp, uh, misery of C Sharp to the joy of Ruby, which is actually nonsense because they're both kind of quite fun to work in. It's just a very different way of thinking. Um, so to tell you a little bit about me, uh, my very first job was for a French company called France Telecom, who I suspect most of you know, um, where I did a lot of Java. And it's okay. You know, I've got nothing against it. This is my first job as a developer. So I was a pretty novice coder at the time. Uh, I didn't really know what I was doing. So, you know, I can't really comment on it much. Um, after a couple of years, I went to work for a company called Factiva, which is now part of Dow Jones News International or something, uh, where I did a lot of C++. And I'm working on the source code for AltaVista, huge, in Vi, uh, on a Linux kernel, uh, and uh, it took like four hours to compile. Um, this was basically, I'm ready for lunch. I want a long lunch. Compile, go to the pub. Um, I don't advocate that kind of behavior, by the way. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it then usually broke within five minutes because I missed a semicolon or something really stupid. Um, I am not a great C++ developer. Um, then I went to work for a company called Codehouse, uh, which is a .NET consultancy based in London. And that was my previous job. Uh, and I was doing C Sharp there. Um, and it's OK. This was the point at which, in my career, I think I'd reached where I was a pretty good programmer. I could work with C Sharp. I knew what I was doing. You know, I was having fun with it. Um, but I kind of got bored of doing that anyway. And I went to have a Twilio, where I get to use Ruby, which makes me happy. Um, in actual fact, at Twilio, so to be fair, I do like loads of different languages. So I've been there for six, seven months now, and I've done uh, Python, Java, C Sharp, maybe a little bit of PHP, plenty of Ruby. Uh, but Ruby is kind of my go-to language, and this is you know, kind of where I am. So something very important I need to tell you about all everything I have just told you is it's a complete lie. Um, I actually have a few extra jobs I didn't mention in there, and some of that code's all mixed around a bit as to when I did it and what I did. Uh, but that's kind of the outline. I've basically been doing C Sharp for about 10 years at various different jobs in there. So the first thing I really want to talk about is, as a programmer, I think our experience of working with a programming language is typically shaped by the tools we use. Um, if, you know, to, to, to kind of get a little bit of Twilio in here, um, Twilio works very hard in our kind of developer experience and our API works because we think, well, the way you use our API will affect how you feel about us. And I think the way, you know, the way you interact with your programming language affects how you feel about it. So if you want to look at this from the C-sharp point of view, you basically have one choice. And it's this big sprawling piece of software called Visual Studio. Um, if you really want to, you could use um, a notepad and learn how to use the compiler and do it all in like the DOS prompt and everything else, and it's, it's messy. And my colleagues have pointed out to me there are a few other options, but pretty much this is your go-to thing. It's a huge application, right? It's enormous. Um, it does loads of things, and I've used it from version 2003 to 2012. I know that really means nothing with Microsoft's new numbering systems. I prefer like version 6, 7. Eight, nine, it's easy. Um, so, yeah, it's it's big. It's got like, it's got like database explorers and server connectors, and it can push your code to to Azure and all these kind of things. And it's kind of cool, and it has a lot of features in it. But there's one feature in it which I think is really important, which is called IntelliSense. Now, uh, I just realised that's French and it's rude. Um, those of you who are familiar with using IDEs will recognise this kind of code completion, right? I mean, is there anybody who has never seen this kind of thing, honestly? <gasps> okay, we'll talk after. Um, so yeah, so all you're basically doing is as you, as you access an object somewhere up here, uh, it's giving you this set of options to say, hey, here are all the different things you can select. And this has been my experience of programming pretty much since I left university more than 10 years ago, but I'm not saying how much. Um, and the problem is, it's a trap. I know this is not the first time we've seen this, but anyway, thank you very much. 
You always go on first. No. So uh, the problem is, is you get so used to using this, especially in a language like C Sharp, that you end up with, if you access all the properties, constructors, and methods on the string class, uh, there's kind of a lot of them. And that's hard to learn. So that's for string. Um, yeah. I can remember, like, length, uh, substring, uh, index of, last index of, one of the constructors. That's about it. That's like five things I can remember about this one off the top of my head. Um, yeah, there's a lot. But anyway, that's kind of a lie. Uh, in actual fact, of that entire set of things I just flashed up on the screen, about a third of them are extension methods, which are kind of like Ruby modules mixed in things and apply to lots of stuff. But you get the idea, right? It, it's pretty crazy. So what about Ruby land? So when I start learning to work with Ruby, and I do what uh, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I personally think is a common error where I can't separate Rails and Ruby. And I start off doing Ruby on Rails thinking that's the thing. And it takes me a little while to untangle these. So I do what I expect, and I go and use an IDE. And I start with something called RubyMine. Anybody use RubyMine? Yeah, OK, a couple of people. What do you think? Good? Bad? Yeah, OK, I'm getting some nodding. Um, I love it. I think it's amazing, right? I think those guys wrote a fantastic IDE. But it has this fairly fundamental problem, which is if you had old Apple stuff and you know old Java stuff, it's brilliant. Because it needs to run in 64-bit, uh, running it on latest OS X kind of turns your computer into an expensive space heater, um, and it's not that fast. But also, I become very conscious of the fact that I'm depending on IntelliSense and code suggestions again, which I don't want to do. So I start using. TextMate. Now, I am aware there are some other text editors out there that some people like to talk about. Uh, I don't want to have that conversation today, but I realize you know, I'm not using all of this extra stuff anymore. I'm not using all of this cruft I'm used to from Visual Studio. So how far down this rabbit hole can I go? Do I really need TextMate? And then I think, you know what? Actually, you can go too far. So let's move on. TextMate basically gives me I do actually use Vi uh, for single file stuff. It's fine. It's great. You know, SSH into a server, Vi, whatever. I remember about 1% of the commands. Um, but for most of what I'm doing, as soon as I want to do something like Rails um, or like more than a single file Sinatra app, I want to be able to swap between files all the time. I want to be able to go and view, you know, go to an ERB, go back to my model, all this kind of stuff. And to be honest, this will do. TextMate, syntax highlighting, that's pretty much all I need. Everything else I try and do in the terminal just because it's good behavior. Anyway, moving on. So some language features. So I just want to go on to a few little points that give you an idea about the structure of the C Sharp, mostly. And, and I'm not going to tell you guys about Ruby, because I bet you all know it better than I do. Incidentally, has anybody in here used C Sharp? Been a C Sharp developer? One, two, three, four, five. OK, a couple. Uh, please tell me where I'm wrong. That's most of it. Um, so a couple of key differences to be aware in mind of. Um, C Sharp and the whole .NET framework, mostly, is a strongly typed language, which means, certainly in C Sharp, when I create a thing and say it's going to be a string, it is a string for its entire lifetime. Okay, I can't do like I can in Ruby, you create something, assign it a string, a bit later, make it a Boolean, then whatever. I just can't do that. Um, it's compiled. So you write your code, you compile it, it stores it into a sort of binary. Um, it's actually bytecode that it's going to execute in a kind of virtual machine. It's mechanics of it I don't really understand that well. Um, it's pretty well memory managed. It has a garbage collector, which is quite amusing because you can put things, like get rid of things, and then go and get them back from the garbage collector. I don't know any case where you would ever want to do that, but if anyone can think of one, I'd love to hear it. Um, it's pretty fast. Uh, I have comments to say about what happened when the London Stock Exchange rebuilt using Microsoft technologies, but it's been pointed out to me that was probably bad code. Blaming no consultancies. Um, and it's very, very, very common in big enterprises. If you go and work for a big company, you go and work for a bank or whatever else, what you're going to find is they probably use Java or they probably use C Sharp and they likely use both. Uh, so it's extremely common in enterprises. And the thing that really freaked me out when I realized this is it's pretty young. Um, the first time I held C Sharp on a, probably a CD was in 2001. Uh, and it was a beta release of version 1.0 of Microsoft.NET Framework. Um, and it occurs to me that Ruby is older, which is interesting. But there we are. I'm not going to make any comment about that. So thinking as a C-sharp developer, um, I'm borrowing from Apple a bit here in terms of you know think differently, but let's just not go there. So come on. C-sharp is a very verbose language. So this is the same code in C-sharp and Ruby. Um, the problem with C-sharp is yeah, you, it doesn't have like an inline interpreter. You can't like start an interactive session. You can't start an IRC sharp or anything like that. 
That makes no sense. You know what I mean. Um, but the reason it does this is because it has a lot of this structure that it needs. It needs these class definitions. It has this static void main that always depends on it. It always has this standard library import that it uses to get going. I mean, why you, if you import it for everything, why not just import it by default? But that's just the way it works. So it has this very particular structure. And Ruby will let you get away without that a lot of the time because it's a scripting language, really, right? Now, you can do all of this stuff in Ruby, but you don't have to. So, you know, it's, it's a very verbose thing to do. The next one, and I'm going to go kind of fast and kind of deep here, are interfaces. And that indentation is wrong. Not my fault, honest. Keynote, curse you! Anyway, um, so is everybody pretty familiar with what this does? This creates a class called a message handler. And in that, so in, in, bleh, inside of that, it creates a method called send message, which is explicitly saying, I will return a Boolean. Um, they should have the word public all over them, because otherwise you can't use it. But you know what? That's good enough. Um, the problem is, this message handler, I can use it to send messages, but I want to be able to send lots of different types of messages and dynamically change what's going on. So we add an interface. Does anybody recognize what this might do? OK, that's good. So what's happening here is we define an interface as effectively an implementationless class. It's a contract that you're giving and using in a strongly typed language to say, hey, things that say I expect an iMessageable type conform and have this send message method. So you can pass them around by their interface type rather than by their class type. So I can create instances of email handler and SMS handler, pass them around as if they were types of iMessageable, just like over here, and they will always do the same thing. So that means this method over here, this notify method, can rely on the fact that any iMessageable type it's given will have that send message thing. In a strongly typed language, this is brilliant. Because if you mess this up, if you screw any of these things up or you don't implement it properly, the compiler won't even let you get to the point where you can run the code. In fact, if you're working in Visual Studio, it's Visual Studio is going to tell you before you finish writing the code, it's going to say, no, these are incompatible types. Rethink that and try harder. Of course, in Ruby, it's going to let you run it, and you're only going to find out it goes wrong at execution time when it tries to find a method, and then it gets into all kinds of mess. So this is how like, C Sharp developers think about this stuff. And what it means is we can also do a form of multiple inheritance. So I could define three different interfaces, SMSable, callable, and VoIPable. You know, I'm still from Twilio, right? Um, and then I can say that my superhandler can do all three of these things. So then I can now pass my superhandler to anything that can handle iMessageable, or iCallable, or iVoIPable, or that should be iSMSable. Hey, mistake in my own slides on the stage. Nice one. Um, and it starts becoming very easy to do. It means I really want this kind of thing in Ruby because I want to be able to depend on the types because I still think in terms of very strict typing, in terms of everything I do should have you know, a very specific type attached to it. One other thing that was really freaky is this class here. So this is just creating a very simple class that is inheriting, this is actual inheritance, not interface, um, from this thing called an attribute. And an attribute is a way in Microsoft Framework of attaching metadata to other things, specifically classes. So this thing up here, we can access using a technology called reflection in code and find out about the code we're running. So what this one is doing is this is saying, this is now an attribute we can use, just like this attribute usage thing here, that has an author, which has a name and a version. So if I apply that to something, I can apply it to this method here and say the author of this is me and it's version one. I don't quite know why you'd want to do that one, but it's a pretty good example taken directly from Microsoft website. And you know, we use this stuff. I once built a whole thing for importing large blocks of XML that were subject to change very frequently. And all it did is it looked at the XML, then it used reflection to work out what the best method to call was to run it. I mean, it's weird, but again, it's just kind of one of the things we do. It's part of our toolbox. This is kind of getting a little bit advanced, and a lot of developers I've worked with um, would look at this and go, eh, what the hell is going on? Um, but that's because they're kind of early in their careers and may not have gotten to this level of insanity. So uh, learning to think in more of a Ruby way. Um, when I started learning to do Ruby, I was still doing C Sharp. And I picked up a whole load of cool things you could do in Ruby, and I tried to retrospectively apply them to C Sharp with mixed results. So first of all, you guys love yourselves. Well, you love self. Uh, in C Sharp, we don't do this. Uh, if you have a reference to an object and you return the object, 
you, why do you need the reference in the first? Oh, well, well, how do you call it? It's very confusing for a C-sharp developer to look at this. Um, it is perfectly possible. You can absolutely do it. But again, this is one of those things that if you give to certainly the more junior guys or whatever, they'll look at it like, what the hell is that doing? Um, I'm told this is called a uh, fluent interface. And what it allows you to do is method chaining. And this is awesome. Like, learning to do this in Ruby it was fantastic for me. This is a complete, like, revelation. So, obviously, this piece of code is completely meaningless and does nothing. Um, but the ability to start doing these kind of pipelines and chains of things together to achieve stuff is just phenomenal. And this concept of, you know, the classic Ruby one-liner is, like, for me, is now a hobby of finding amusing things that I can do. Um, also, on a complete side note, this thing here, what? What? They're strings. No, they're lit. Why are they? Co they're like compilers. No, they're strings. But they're comp. What? This is confusing. I mean, this is really confusing. Um, it's nice and it's fantastic. It's incredibly useful, but it's really, really confusing. Anyway, speaking of confusing, seriously. So, as a C sharp developer coming to Ruby, uh, you go through three three states when you discover this. The first one is WTF, basically. I mean, it's like you have code that generates more code that can be run when you what? Because, of course, we have a compiler. We compile it all at the beginning, and then we run it. But no, let's, let's change things and move things around. Um, then once you start to kind of understand it more, you get to the state where you're basically confused by it, and it's just heresy. Um, when I first discovered this, I was pretty sure that somewhere out there, uh, uh, Brian Kerningen is crying into his coffee and Dennis Ritchie was spitting in his grave, I suspect, by that point. Because um, this is nuts. I mean, like, totally nuts. But then I understand it. And it's like, oh, well, that was a nice timing. It's awesome, right? So I actually, I, I'm going to go through a great example I use for this. And it really was, like, mind-blowing when I finally figured out what you can use it for. And it started to raise all kinds of questions I have, and I'd love to have a debate with someone about this sometime, about the depth you can go with like genetic programming and machine learning in Ruby with like 10 lines of code. So I love having my console output colorized. Okay, so I wrote this module that I can just pull in that just defines like uh, the, the foreground and background and like there's 22 colors, so obviously I've abbreviated. Uh, and I have FG red and FG blue, and then BG red and BG blue, and green and yellow, and of course, blink, because you know, <laughs> it's 2013. Um, and then I think, well, actually, this code is kind of inefficient, because I've got 46 something methods, and they're just like using this same little bit of text string to make the console colorize the output. That's kind of stupid. Uh, why don't I just change that? So, oh. Oh, there's a fairly glaring error in that. Um, so instead of having like all of these methods define the same thing, I just have them call this method with the appropriate color code and the appropriate text. But all I've really done is I've just added one extra method. It's slightly more maintainable, because if I have to change this thing, I don't have to change it anywhere. But um, yeah, that's, you know. And then I discover metaprogramming. And I end up with something that looks more like this, which is way better. Uh, I've removed a few colors, and there's also a foreground, uh, background version for this as well. But that is amazing. And it's like, so uh, coming to this from a C-sharp point of view and thinking, so I don't have to write all of my code because I can write code that writes it all for me. And that's it. I can never touch Visual Studio ever again. They probably won't let me. So uh, yeah, speaking of weird stuff, then I discovered this one. What the hell is that? Jesus. So, uh, and <laughs> this comes back to working with Rails, right? So I'm, I'm playing around with Rails, and it's like, uh, so I've got my model, like, you know, so the classic example of like a blogging engine, and it's like posts dot find by published and title. And I'm thinking, I define these models, right? How does it know every possible combination of everything I could use? Because if I create a model that's got like 50 different things on it, how is it? I mean, that's thousands. Where is it defining these? I can't find them in my code. What the hell is going on? I reckon it took me a year before I understood it well enough to know that this is what it's doing. Um, and it's super, super smart. I mean, it's so clever. And this is where I kind of come back to that idea about you know connecting um, 
like meta programming and method missing and undefined method, which I wasn't even going to go into here, um, to actually start getting it to the, the thing to start working out what's going on. Like, you know, define all your expressions, tie them all together, have it define new methods that use random combinations of the expressions. And then basically, I'm pretty sure I can write one class that you can just feed into some like RSpec tests and it will just work out whatever the solution is you asked for. Um, I'm not going to try that. Anyway, so. Um, yeah, the basic reason I think you can do all this kind of crazy stuff is because you guys have, you know, loose typing. You know, it's it's script typing, it's duct typing, whatever you call it. And I'm still getting around to this way of thinking because I've never been much of a JavaScript developer, so I just really don't have to deal with this stuff. I've always been, you know, C sharp, Java, C plus plus, and I still think like that. So it's really confusing to me all the time. Every time I write something like this, it's like, oh well, you know, I've got to like. I've got to start working and remembering what I'm passing around and work out what I'm supposed to pass to what. Um, and basically, it's this level of freedom that you get to kind of do really whatever you want. Um, and the thing that's really, really started to get drilled into me, which I think is a bad habit you get as a C-sharp developer, is we're really bad at testing, I think. I mean, I'm totally sure there's loads of people out there who are fantastic at it. But what I have found is the structure of the language in Ruby forces you down this route where if you don't write really good tests for your code, you are so screwed. Um, but yeah, but the upshot is, as far as I can tell, it's like this kind of free hippie love and everything's happy. And it's really nice to be able to do whatever the hell I want for once. Um, so that's pretty much all I wanted to tell you about it today. Uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to shout out. Uh, otherwise, you can contact me there or tweet me there. And um, I'm around for the rest of the evening, and I do have some Twilio stickers if anyone wants one. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's also the extent of my French, by the way. Than saying I work for France Telecom pour deux années, or something like that. Any questions? They know it's lunchtime, that's why. You, you told us um, everything you, you understood from Ruby, but uh, what can we learn from, from uh, .NET? Hmm. I'm very tempted to say very little, uh, but that's probably not true. Um, so .NET is a really big, well-designed framework that's designed by like a team of guys at Microsoft who know exactly what they're doing. And they're constantly expanding on the way the language works and the way it's structured. But I think what, what I found is in order to start doing some of the kind of .NET-y stuff, if you were to try and start thinking about bringing those structures into Ruby, you'd lose too much of what makes Ruby Ruby. So you know, it, if you've ever done any C++, there's this thing called the standard template library. And I think there's a much more recent version of it called Boost. This stuff is um, And like they've introduced a lot of that stuff into .NET from version two or three, I think. Um, and I do kind of miss some of those like richer structures. You know, so when you start doing things like generics and all this kind of stuff, it's, it's pretty intense. But when you think about it, you start looking at Ruby's basically arrays and hashes. It's like, well, actually, that pretty much does everything you could do with those dynamic structures because it doesn't need all of the cruft. All those dynamic structures are giving you is the ability to do things Ruby lets you do by being so loose and free. Um, so I think, to be honest with you, I'd prefer to say, hey, Ruby guys, stay Ruby guys. Don't, 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 don't look here. Don't look here. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I don't know, really. Was that a crappiest answer ever or not? No. Uh, as a former C++ developer, I understand your delight to switching to uh, Ruby. Um, do you think Ruby is too easy and that the beginners uh, it's it's really a nice time for beginners to uh, to get to grip with it, but do you think it's too easy? Um, that's a very interesting question. So when I was at college, a um, very, very long time ago, there was a fake interview on the wall, supposedly from the guy who invented C++, saying how he basically invented C++ because it was getting too cheap to hire C developers and he wanted a massive pay rise, so he invented this really complex thing called C++. Um, I think it's nonsense. but. I don't know that there's ever such a thing as too easy. I mean, I think if you build something to the scale of, you know, like a Facebook or a Twitter is a pretty good example, actually, and you build it in Ruby, at some point, you've got some really hard problems to solve. You've still got the same hard problems. You, you know, I'm very good at, I'm very superficial with programming languages. I will say, oh, that method does what I want. I'll use it and carry on. 
Whereas a bunch of guys I've worked for, and like these guys are amazing, they will say, that method does something like I think I want. I'm going to dig into it, find out exactly what it does and how it works and really understand it. And I think it depends on how you approach the language. And I personally, at the moment, have been taking Ruby in much the same way. I can just kind of glide through it, make it do pretty much everything I want to do in quite an easy kind of ice skatey, just slip straight through way. And that's the easiness I think you're talking about. But I think in actual fact, if I were to start digging into it and looking at all the possible like performance issues with my code. So like from the first talk, you know, we're talking about different databases you could use and all the problems you want to get into there. And then uh, and then from Ben's talk, we're talking about the security issues you could have. And all of these nightmares start coming up as soon as you go from, hey, this is a nice, easy thing running in my terminal to this is actually running, you know, like in production. And people are trying to attack my system. And then I think you still get all of the same problems. But um, one last thing I would say, actually, is the downside to harder languages is the pain you have to go through. Uh, a colleague of mine, when I worked at Factiva, um, always used to say, and I think someone else told him this, is that working with like Java and C Sharp is like trying to carve a bar of soap with a wooden spoon. You're going to kind of get the shape that you want. But if you want something perfect, then you need to go to C++ and use a razor blade. And you're going to get exactly what you want. But you're going to cut your hands up doing it. So the question is, how much pain do you want for how much precision? And I think Ruby, for me, is you know, a lot less pain for a lot more precision than I feel I should be getting for a language that easy. Yeah, there you go. Is there any question? Yeah. I kind of like uh, your talk. I, I, I can relate as a current C++ developer. <laughs> um, but uh, it's true that Ruby is very flexible. But I think that uh, what really strikes me is that the inventivity and the creativity of the Ruby community. Uh, I'm so they, they bring a lot of game changer, Rails or uh, Cucumber uh, that have spread everywhere. Uh, how do you compare uh, the community of uh, the, differ the different tech community to the Ruby one? So I think um, it's an excellent question. I was talking uh, to some of the guys as we walked over here this morning about this. And I think there are two ways of looking at it. There is the, the people community, and there is the sort of mass community. And the interesting thing I've noticed is in the last couple of uh, Ruby conferences I've been to, there's this general tendency, and I'm aware that I'm sort of slightly guilty of it, to say, hey, look at this amazing language over here. We should be doing some of these things. You know, we should do that in Ruby, because you know, Ruby needs more stuff. Um, whereas then you go to like a, you know, like a Python conference or a PHP conference, everyone is like, PHP is awesome! It's like, well, OK, all right. But I think that's a good thing. That's, you know, I think that's the Ruby community kind of looking out to the world and saying, well, how can we be better? How can we improve? You know? And then I think from the point of view of like the, the, the language and the structure as a whole, um, it, certainly from Microsoft's point of view, it is not an open source language. You know, Very little of their stuff is open source. I mean, it's only in this very latest version of Visual Studio, which is 2012, that they've got something like Git support. Um, I mean, it, it was pretty painful using GitHub, for example, with Visual Studio 2010. It's totally possible, but it was a little bit clunky. Um, and it, I think they just have this approach of, and I was saying someone outside, actually, um, you know, with Ruby, if you want to build something with Ruby, there's a library for everything. It's full of Ben's malicious code, but there's a library for everything. Um, in C Sharp, that's way less common. Um, I spent two and a half years building on a huge uh, CMS system called Sitecore. This is whilst I worked at Codehouse. And we pretty much used out of the box Visual Studio C Sharp with the libraries it came with and the libraries that came with the CMS. We didn't need to go out and pull in extra libraries to do anything. I think the exception is a JSON parser, which is freaking hilarious if you think about it. Um, and you know, it's just that tendency. You start living in Microsoft's world because that's where they want you. Um, they've got a lot better at it now. They have a thing called NuGet, which is a package manager, um, and they let you pull a lot more stuff in. But still, they don't have that big open source sense of community with lots of people building lots of awesome things. A good example of a C Sharp NuGet package is, of course, the Twilio client API. But, you know, I'll... no. Okay, last Shame question. Plug. <laughs> yeah, about the the beauty of the metaprogramming, the three steps. Maybe you will find out that there is a fourth step, the one where you find out this, you can cut both your arms and legs with it, and maybe it's not a good idea to use it everywhere, but. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm just hoping that's that's the day I decide to, you know, become a horticulturalist or something, or, a, you know, 
I don't know, a taxi driver. Um, yeah, that, that might be the day I, I have to give up programming, or certainly running. I, I don't know. Awesome. Thanks very much, Thank you. Thank you very much.